Hello there. Often talked about avoiding ugly waste and pursuing long-term happiness or balanced design or really good thinking. Hi, I'm Bert Sarkinen, I'm your host today, also the owner of Aero Timber Framing and the author of The Art of Hybrid Timber Framing. It's a book about getting what you want with timbers, if you're going to influence your style at all, with decorative timbers. So, you know, this concept of getting what you want, your style, all of this, and that, that avoiding ugly waste and pursuing long-term happiness reminds me of a time in my life when my boys went through the fort building stage. I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've experienced this or witnessed this, but it's really fun to watch. I've got three boys, 30 close in age, and our shop is on five acres with kind of some woods and bushes around. And so one day during the, the tree fort building stage, the fort building stage, my shop foreman came to me and said, hey, Bert, we need some nails. I said, what, nails? We don't use nails. And we just had a 50 pound box sitting over in the corner and the foreman kind of chuckled and he pointed around the shop. He said, take a look around. He said, your boys have been hard at work and there's little forts popped up here and there. It looks like a old west shanty town. And I kind of teased one of my boys. I said, ah, that's kind of weird. The forts are all right around the shop here. They're not farther out back in the wood. And my son, who might have been 10 at the time, looked at me like, Dad, Dad, we don't want to haul the boards way out in the woods. So they had proximity of scrap lumber, nails, forest. Hey, what's not to enjoy? And that is kind of the epitome of pursuing long-term happiness. These boys just didn't really know their why. They just want to do something, just like you with your itch of building something. That you want to do something. You may be drawn to classic. You may be drawn to craftsman. But that feeling of purpose and happiness and fulfillment is a little bit like catching a butterfly or watching a butterfly. If you try to catch that butterfly and keep it in a jar or pin it to a board for a collection, the happiness is going to die. And another evolution of this fort building stage is kind of funny. So my youngest son, they had really got into it was almost multi-generational in the age of kids build forts, but they called this fort the nub. And when it was done, it evolved slowly over time. When it was done, it looked like a prisoner of war camp. They had a jail built with all these logs and little branches and stuff put together. They fabricated some sort of door and lock. They had barbed wire, trying to mimic Constantino wire. And just really only boys could get there with that slap dash. Hey, let's do this. And, you know, how things evolve during that part of it. And one summer, my youngest son told my wife that he wanted to just wear his shorts, never take off his shorts the whole summer. Summer was going to be delightful and fun. And he was, of course, spending a lot of time at the nub. He had would buy top ramen and eat out there and sleep out there. And But he did manage that whole summer with just the shorts. My wife looked at it and figured, well, you know, he's – and swimming in pool water a lot, chlorine. And uh, so he was brown like a nut and just glorious summer days. He would even put his church pants over his shorts so he could indeed fulfill his vow that he really was in shorts the whole summer and totally enjoyed it. Good time in life. Eventually, that died and went on, but uh, to, on the other side of that just spontaneous boyish fun, that whole summer thing, I built a playhouse for my wife, less of a playhouse than a, that she's Swedish, her parents are from Sweden, so it was a kind of traditional Swedish red with the white trim and the board and bat siding, and she just wanted that out in the sandbox as a little playhouse, and plant some tulips around it and likes it. 
it doesn't get used much and certainly didn't get used as much as the nub, not even a fraction. And it makes me stop and think about, you know, why? And it also applies to what we're doing here with, you know, what, if you're classic, you're gonna like some things about class, classic, you like some things about craftsman, but that whole juxtaposition of spontaneous fun and precision planning and all of this, you know, can they be married? It's one of the things we try to do. I try to do when I'm talking with people is let the spontaneous fun and generate a bunch of ideas and then just try to take some of that and unify it and help help guide that. Really rewarding. It's been a fun ride and lots of projects down the river. Um, and one of the cardinal sins, in my opinion, if I were to get really heavy handed and say, yeah, I really think you're gonna be happiest with this. And I might be right with this type of design and you may just say that I think you're just classic and I keep pushing for this. And maybe you like a lot of aspects over here. And I keep pulling you back over there. That would be a cardinal sin in my eyes. It's a little bit like, let's go back to the tree fort thing and forts and kids. Say for example, that my son wanted to build a fort and I kind of got wind of it. And okay, you know, asked me a few questions. I just kind of told him, hey, on the early days, I helped him build the floor so it was safe when they were a little younger. I didn't want the whole thing crashing down. But then beyond that, they could hack it together and you know, be the owners of it. So they had total ownership. But if I had taken this tree fort idea, got it plumb level square, maybe paint the trim, fabricate a door and a window and maybe a slide and or a pole, all these little gizzies, well, that would be me, Papa Bear, getting excited for my kid and wanting to help out, but missing the point. And so I would have taken that thing, built this whole fort, and I can guarantee you, you see it time and time again, that the boys wouldn't have spent a near amount of time in that fort because it's, it's not a fort. It's missing the point. It's not theirs and no ownership. So that's that that's a, a big thing in in how we want to proceed. And so with that in mind, let's move on. Okay, the first part of what we're going to cover today, again, is going to be general characteristics. It may be a little bit dry, a little bit boring, and you may only retain a tenth of what we cover. That's okay. What we're trying to do for you is give you kind of an overview, some pieces that you can refer back to as you're trying to communicate, understand what you want, and just kind of some general characteristics just to get start building an intuitive feel, okay? So don't sweat it if the details kind of blow by a little bit. We're gonna have a lot of pictures which will help build that intuitive feel. And what I really want you to do is to listen or look with two tracks. So on one side, the what do I like and dislike? And then on the other side, what are some of these design truths or principles that come up time and time again, no matter what style we're dealing with? And just start to absorb that. So, and we're gonna come back to that, these, these dry bones characteristics. We're going to try to refer back to that as much as I can remember as we're going through these. We've got quite a few people, quite a few pictures. Go through that and bring it back to the ground for you. We're going to also move into trade-off decisions, just a small sampling and introspection for you. So you can make decisions with confidence. There's a couple pieces of that, and we'll get into that. And then determining your preference, you know, that basically, you know, when you're listening on those two tracks, just pay attention to what pings the likes, ah, and what pings the, ah, meh. You know, just, just pay attention to that. And we've got a live a bonus for live viewers, and we've got a question and answer at the end. And here's some sample questions we preloaded just to prime the pump and get you thinking. 
So what if my style is different than my spouse's? And I hear this a lot. And it's a concern if it's not handled right. But usually things work out pretty good and it forces creativity and forces something unique, forces something good. Whoops, I'm getting into the answers here. All right, so I just want you to kind of look at this. You know, what if my style is all over the map? Is my builder speaking my language? Which style is best for me? All these things are going to be good things to think about as you're moving forward. Okay, here we are, dry bones. We're at the top level here. This is labels, names, categories, and we're going to move down into how you would describe these two classic and craftsmen if you were talking to a friend, as well as then we're going to move down again to timbers. What are what are some of the timber nuances that would make a timber style classic or a craftsman? Okay. So with classic, you've got Southern, country, Greek revival, neoclassic, colonial, or federal. And classic is, so those are some labels. And if you look back and look at you know, styles and, and different things, how they're named, you find some some consistencies or similarities with all of these. And we've lumped these together to create classic as we define it with timber style. Classic is one of those things, when you think about a classic car, what do you think about? Or there's there's classic home styles that just kind of become a classic. What What is that? What is that? And so in my mind, when I think of classic, it, it's got to be something that has been around, that, that was produced, and you don't know a classic until it's done, in like the, the example of a car. But yet there's something that has just got some vibes, some lines, some something that really just vi generates good vibes and hangs around. Homes can have different roof lines, cars, different shapes, silhouettes, and they just resonate for a long time and then therefore they never go out of style. It kind of makes them a classic. That's what we're talking about with architecture. So classic is never going to be like really wild and zesty is for in, in some sort of weird way. It's, it, they're always going to be just muted, muted, nuanced flavors, lines, that sort of thing. Craftsman, when you think about craftsman, you've got bungalow, uh, you could have cabin here a little bit because it's small or uh, not. Cabin kind of goes a little bit more with rustic, but cottage, prairie. Western Ranch thing you know, that we see a lot of the low roof lines and big overhangs with that, you know, ranch rustic. So they kind of blend and then arts and crafts and with arts and crafts. This was about the turn of the century. The craftsman movement it was often called arts and crafts. And it was kind of a pushback to the ornate Victorian style that was dominating the day back then. So there was, they still kept the quality and of course craftsmanship, that's where that comes from. But the lines were clean and things had purpose and there was no freely extras. That's kind of the overview here for the, for our top level of just big words and labels and that sort of thing. So let's move down to if you were talking to a friend and going to describe to them, what does classic look like or what does craftsman look like? So with craftsman, we mentioned that before, it's low, low slope roofs, big overhangs. A lot of times the overhangs will have kind of a nice little detail that's simple, but you know, with the big overhang and, and you see the, the big porches with the elliptical spaces here, the big front porch. And uh, but the footprint rather small, and everything has a purpose, not a lot of waste, well thought through. Angular detailing, the rambling porches. I said small foot, but they can go large here. But when I think about bungalow, that early arts and crafts is really small. 
since then with people with different needs and what they're building, the sprawling footprint has become more common. But the low massing, nothing real soaring, nothing real high. And with classic, you're kind of in that middle ground with the semi-steep roofs. Uh, your silhouettes are, you know, somewhat tall, medium. The massing is is never going to be extreme one way or the other. A refined, refined is a good word. Presentation, just it's it's like somebody who has real money. They're they got plenty of money. A lot of times what you'll see is that they don't go for flashy, over-the-top, look at me. It's You can see gray cars, and the wealth is there, but it's, it's like they don't have to prove anything. A little bit of the same thing with classic as a home style. Said so kind of if you, if you get that. Get that as kind of a – just if you were to personify a classic style, maybe that would be – in the direction it would go. Okay, so here we are to the timber detailing. Soft arches in classic. You know, we talked about the average roof slope, the triangular thing. It's it's never super crazy as far as you know, steep roofs or even the knee braces. A lot of times on Euro will be more oriented steep, but not so much with classic. Uh, Medium sparse density, timber sizing, and muted detailing. So the chamfering on the edges or anything like that is, is not going to be over the top and very ornate. Might be there, but but uh, it's similar to Craftsman in that way with the detailing. The detailing is going to be, if it's there, it's going to be precise, purposeful, and not on every corner you could possibly put a chamfer, for example. So with Craftsman, you know, the, the detailing on it is purposeful. A lot of times with the Craftsman type of entry beam, we might have a kind of a taper up, come up again, maybe another taper, another so that could be, and then that would carry off and then repeat over here on this side. But that's that's a detail that's you know real angular, purposeful, precise, crisp, all that with the craftsman piece here. Uh, taper beams. This isn't totally just with craftsman, but this step piece here that I'm referring to, not too busy. And this here with craftsman. Really got to watch you don't get too busy. That's the vibe you're looking for. Can't get too busy. And then your medium-sized timbers as well as spacing and density. Okay, we talked about trade-offs. So on your building journey, whatever you're going to do, there's two things that are probably the most important things you could do for yourself for your builder, for anyone working on the project, because it's gonna take save time, money, headache, frustration, conflict, all of the above. One is trade-offs. How can we handle trade-offs effectively? The other has to do with getting your head in the right spot so you can deal effectively with trade-offs. So if I was gonna do it, this would be number two. What would number one be? What do you suppose the most important thing? I'll say two things here for getting your head on straight, for making it a dynamite project, for making it a fun experience, for getting good memories, all of the above, right? So big questions, why? If you're a kid doing a tree fort, it might not be just more intuitive. So we have to pay attention to that as well. And then there's the what. So why in the what? You are the visionary. You're the driving force. If you're a professional watching this, the one thing to keep in mind is 
getting questions in front of your clients that will reveal these two questions. Why are they doing it? What are they really trying to accomplish? What are they about? What type of people are they? And we just did an article that really digs a little deeper into this, these two points in our inspiration report. And I've got a shameless plug in the article for this book. It's hardcover. It is available for pre-order now. And it comes with a handy dandy timber planning guide as a bonus. We're gonna, during the launch, we're gonna promote it that way because we just want people to get the what they want for their investment when they're building and doing this. Anything to anything at all to to how exposed beams will affect and influence space. Okay, so back to the trade-offs here. So if, if you can get these two done, now with the trade-offs, if there's one thing you're gonna write down from this whole seminar, it'd be this right here, why and what, and then trade-offs. And the thing with trade-offs is you have to build a no list. Figure out what you're gonna say no to. In this example, I've got a, you know, you're looking for a vehicle. Say you're looking for a vehicle and, okay, so you need something to haul stuff with, but you don't need big deliveries or big trailers. You might settle on a one pound or a three quarter ton truck. Figure out, no, that's a good choice. That way you use it from time to time, haul a camper, maybe haul some stuff to the dump, whatever it is. Okay, so before you start even getting to this one ton, the way to work with this trade-off continuum that can really help you figure out what to say no to and be totally comfortable with it is to first decide, if I had to pick one extreme or the other, slow hauling, big, or fast commuting, you know, which would it be? If it's one or the other, one or the other. I, yes, I know that you got some capacity here in the middle, but one or the other, what is it gonna be? Well, in this instance, you would have to take that one because that's how you would predominantly use it because you know from time to time that's where we're at so you can do the fast commuting then you can decide <clears throat> you're at this extreme excuse me here <clears throat> so at this extreme right here now you can find your position there. And so you can say, okay, well, what am I saying no to? It's a big thing. In this example, you would have said, well, I'm saying no to the capacity of a bigger load or bigger trailer or bigger camper, fifth wheel. I'm saying no to good fuel economy. I'm saying no to a less expensive vehicle. And I'm saying no to easy parking and driving. But you can say, okay, well, you know, I'm down with that. I'm okay with those. I can sacrifice that. It just kind of solidifies that decision and makes it easy to move forward. And you're going to have much more complex things to wade through in a building process than looking at a rig. Okay? So it's really important to do these two things. So now let's get a little bit of introspection for you. Of these two descriptions here, what is going to be, okay, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds here. Choose one or the other. If you had to be totally low and horizontal or arched and tasteful, which of those two really resonate? If you had to be one or the other, and you might, you might be more to the middle, but make the choice. Okay, so let's just say that you chose here low and horizontal, and that's craftsman but maybe you don't want it totally that. Maybe it's just in some of the living areas or bedrooms or whatever. Maybe you say, okay, well, I guess I'll go with one, you know. Then you would list out why did you have your pick there? You know, what's your reasoning? And then what are you saying no to? You know, list that out right there. And the best way to do this then is to go through this with a pretty severe take on it. Just hard and fast, straight from the gut, wham, and let it sit for a while, come back and review it. And if you decide that, no, you'd rather move over here for whatever reason, 
Well, it's going to change what you've got here, and you're going to take some of these nodes, you're going to revi revive them, they're going to go back into the hopper is what you get, but there will be new nodes in its place. So that being okay with what you're saying no to really is a key for solid decisions that, okay, done. You don't have to try to go back and examine them and try to keep options open and yada, yada, yada. Okay, here's your second trade-off. Focused and angular, casual and balanced. First, your extreme. If it was one or the other, gun to the head and make a choice now. What is it going to be? Got it? Okay. Now I'll think about where in the spectrum here, if you're here, you know, which of these are you going to choose? And once you've got your choice, list out why, and then what are you saying no to? And you'll have to do the why and the no on your own time, but it's a very good exercise. And then your last continuum here, are Dezeno and Cozy refined and timeless? Extreme first, choice second, why and what are you saying no to? Okay, so that was clear enough, right? So now we're gonna go into some pictures here and got quite a few of them. So this is Craftsman. This has angular posts here. They angle out on the top side. And so you kind of, let me just bring this up for you here so you can see it. So you can see this was just the rendering, the starting point. Originally they had scissor trusses there. And you know, one of the things that, as we looked at this, we really looked at the massing and, and different things. And this was one thing that just, not really anything to do with me, but just looking at the whole thing in general, just like a oyster with a grain of sand and it just kept coming back to me and just itching my mind, driving me nuts. And so one of the things we did with that is we built on this angular piece here. See it there, you see it in the timbers and you see it right here. So what does an angle like that do? And I believe we had it on these posts as well. Just flare out that outside angle. What does that angle do? Why is that so valuable? It's one of these tricks that make you see things differently because it angles out. So why, if we go back to here, see this is, when you look at that, that's, it's fairly high. It's kind of a lookout. This is up in Alaska. You can see the snow on the ground. But that was that was a, a sore thumb in my mind. So I just took liberties and as we designed the timbers, kind of made this blend. So it, you know, if this is a way out of balance, it's going to affect how the timbers look right here. You know what I mean? So back to angles, the taper. What is so Where's the magic? Why is it so good? And really, it's stability. It makes you see things wider when you get out like this. It just gives you a sense of stability. And, and back to the golden ratios, these, these universal truths, when this angles out like that, what it's doing to your eye is it's making this seem less tall and rocket-like to more spaced out wide. So, so we're, we're playing with your eye to where your eye perceives a bigger width than height. So we're kind of getting you to see a golden ratio in your mind by playing with shapes a little bit. Make sense? And so we repeated that theme all through here. And in particular with this lookout tower, I think we dropped it about a foot we made the inside vaulted so that you could have seven foot walls um, and then did that slope. That was the cat's meow. That really brought things together. So that's a little bit on the crafts from that side of things on the back of that same project. 
see that we continued the slope here. We did it both sides, not just the outside. This was plenty wide. So, but then the, the slope both sides really gives you that visual weight for all of this that's going on. And, uh, and then the timbers here, we've got this in multiple styles. The, the knee braces here, it does lean towards craftsmen because it's so purposeful with what it's doing. And one of the, the things that this does is it, it provides first visual beauty. You gotta get that right, the, the, the visual part of it. But it provides lateral bracing side to side. And it also gets us a smaller span for we're carrying this ridge beam that's going back. So a little structural stuff thrown in there as well for you. There's a dead on shot. You see, we've got some corbels here that carry some of that vibe over here. We had played with the roof line a bit. We had brought it down at one point, but it just uh, kind of was a give and take on that piece. And sometimes when it comes to a coin toss, you look at, well, what is the most effective to build? What's going to, require the least amount of funds. Here's another another project we did that has the same same thing with knee braces here. Um, originally there were some stone 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 plinths or, or columns here. And if I was doing this again and knowing that it was gonna come down to here, I may have tried to get the, the knee brace to come closer down, so where it, uh, just for more visual mass here, grounding it. But here you can see also, you can see that, you can see this king post, still kind of simple lines, there's nothing real extravagant, and then it has this step detail. So that's, and there's also a, a reason for doing that with how the, how the timbers are going to come together in the joinery. But that's, that's a little glimpse of the craftsman there. Here we have it in the back. And you see on this one, we brought it a little lower. I do believe when it was designed, there was going to be some, some wood, some stone there, but sometimes it looks cleaner without the stone. Uh, another idea that here you've got the step king post again. It steps up once more there. Skylights, pretty cool for, for getting light in. With Craftsman, so these, these trapezoid windows, sometimes we'll get some designs in where they have trapezoid windows and then have a placeholder with an arch timber. And I either get people to change the arch, get out, get an arch out, get rid of the trapezoid and the windows could go you could go to an arched window or or sometimes what works pretty good is to go with some stepped windows like this if the arched timbers is going to be the style that really resonates that works pretty well as as well, then that would be a little bit more like classic, you know, with the going with something like that. Come to think of it, with Craftsman, there are some arches we've had with Craftsman, and it just goes to goes under underscores that that you know you're unique, everyone's unique, and what resonates with you is going to be tailored for your taste. Here's a before and after, Craftsman. One cool thing about this project, it hasn't happened so often, but you can see that the, the marching orders from the designer, or the other wanted some sort of timber entry. And you know, how did this come about? And so he put a placeholder in there for us. We'd worked with them before. And what we came up with, pretty cool. It's a, uh, an octagonal, the door is kind of at a 45, so we just change this a little bit with the roof coming at the, going around. And the big focus, the big focus on this particular project is really unique in that 
it's not over the top. Like you don't see it from the road and just go, dumb, whoa, cool. It's nothing like that. It's it's more muted. So in that way, you could say kind of classic. And Craftsman and Classic, really, when you do the style quiz online, we've done that a lot. And I see a lot of overlap with Craftsman and Classic. Those two, there's a lot of overlap between those two styles. And part of it is, is that it's not that, wow, look at that lodge. I mean, there's huge timbers or logs or whatever that's just dominate and have this own this fun in their own way. This is so muted that you get in here and it's really intricate, really neat. I'm going to zoom in once more here for you. Can you see this intricate banding and metalwork? Really cool. This is, they're inlaid and worked around, but it is not for the faint of heart when it comes to writing the check. Cool look, arts and crafts all day long. And now that the bill is paid, you walk up and it's cool. It's there forever, right? Or until the, something happens, a fire or something like that. But it's just really a solid investment that brings delight for a long time. But you have to be prepared to write a big number on that particular one. But that's, that's a, a really unique look but definitely arts and crafts for its the attention to detail and its angular pros and the, but the attention to detail there with that metal work here's another view of that and one of the tricks just on a bigger design thing you want to have purpose when you come up so we we designed in these benches so that you know with, when people come come up it kind of guides you through and you get this little experience Great job with the plants and everything, the way it came through. And here's the back. So we're still using pegs and whatnot over here, but just the you know accent, accents there and then down at the bottoms, you can see some down here. And we're back to the, the angular purposeful. I do believe this has a step. This may have a slight curve here, may not, but really, Simple, straightforward. So here's another craftsman, and I talked about craftsmen with curves. This was drawn up with straight beams originally. And it just had the, I believe they had two posts in there. We played off of that idea. But this is really, when you look at this thing in, in whole, you see the stone, you see the detail, the corbels have their own thing. Just all told, you just look at it and yeah, it looks arts and crafts. There's kind of the double posts and the, the fine craftsmanship and different things. They just really say that. With this particular project, we were working again with roof lines to make it fit the timbers one of the things we had to do was lower this garage roof because it was overpowering everything else. We just really had to make this be the star. Another thing that happened is we put just a little flag roof here that helped bring that down to the ground and also mimic the, this flag roof coming down. I think we went, we increased the pitch a bit. Just, it just really flowed a little bit better. And then, Girly, I believe, yeah, uh, client with a cute nickname. Anyway, she really liked the curves, and so you'll see the curves here. But in spite of that, in spite of that, this is really craftsman. Uh, here's a, an example of stone that's really high, but it doesn't look out of place when you look at everything in context. That's that control knob piece and even where these beams are on those and all that plays in unison to, to kind of work it in and just get that solid beauty that it just looks good from all angles and no matter where you're at. Here's a picture of the back patio. Beams cost a pretty penny. You have to get a log that big here. That's, that's, a, that's an endeavor. We have a mill that makes it easier now. 
So good news for you in the future. We played with the same things. The double post really crafts, and then it's softened with a little curve. Um, same thing out here. This outside piece has a little curve to it. Um, and we've got a stone that height was toyed around with to make things look good. So now we're moving to classic. And with this picture, what you'll notice here is this, this soft, long arch. That, that's kind of, you get a strong shape like that, and that's going to really put you into the classic camp in a strong way. Uh, especially with the pieces. You got a few extra pieces here. Sometimes they'll be turned turned perpendicular to the top cord or even somewhere in between. So it's partly perpendicular to the curve. In this case, we have some, some logs, which are going to be a little more rustic. So, you know, you could, you could make a case that, oh, I think this is more rustic. You know, you look at that, the wood on the ceiling and the stone, that seems more rustic to me. You know, and I'm not going to argue that because it's really close, certainly. But because of this big form here, when I see that picture, it's like, ah, that's what, that's where I go with it. Here's the front entry. And with the front entry, with the combination of logs and stone, and then the shorter span here, it's less of that long, dramatic, classic arch, right? So this one could very well be more in the rustic camp. You do have a little more, this wood here is not semi-transparent stain. It's got a gray color, which is gonna push it more back to classic. But those are some of the considerations that when we're talking style and what people want, that, that, that they were kind of lean to when we say classic. And the inside as well has the long sweeping arches. Really cool. Log posts work in. But, uh, and then you've got the sheetrock inside, not wood. So maybe push it a little towards classic rather than rustic. Am I making sense so far? Okay. So you know the drill, right? There is one thing that you'll see in video number three when we talk about Euro. You're going to see an example that has this type of configuration, which we've classified as Euro. So why not here? What, why, why is this not a Euro? Why not? One of the things that's going on here is the big timber sizes. And you've got the timbers and the decking, but yet it's got that strong classic piece to where, uh, you know, when it kind of defies a category, a lot of times classic becomes a catch-all. Just, it's a little easier to throw it in there somehow. And here's a floating gazebo on the same same project, Bethany Vineyards. If you're ever in the area, great place to stop. Beautifully manicured. Okay, so this project right here is interesting because it, it's almost like smack dab between classic and craftsman. You've got a bunch of arches which which would would you know point toward the classic piece here. Bunch of arches and it's soft, but then look at the slope. And that's low. Everything's really like cozy and warm, a welcoming, nothing austere or intimidating. Uh, so I mean, this, this is really a unique project, really turned out well. They did mix this, this particular piece of wood came off of the property for these posts. Heartwood, the really nice to, you know, came from the property used for the build. 
kind of a neat concept. Some people like it, other people don't really care about it. It's another project that has the, the nice strong shape of that flowing arch. Um, the double posts here make it a little bit more ornate, but not, but it's still in the big timber sizes, all that in, in combined, we think, okay, classic. And here's a picture of the front entry, the same project. Again, here you've got the, the stones and the double posts. Really work that up. And that theme continues on in the inside. Here's another project that is got the arched and the big timbers. And somewhat when you look at the when you look at all the heavy stone, you might think lodge. But if you were on the if you were through the whole project, you would see it in person, you'd see why maybe the the, the classification is Wax is classic. And here's a, a classic that gets closer to Euro. The knee braces on the outside get you warm. The nice, uh, because of the space, that was a way to create it, make it feel wider. And the high stone offsets some of that tall, top heavy piece here and we have the webs here as well which is as soon as you start getting webs and more pieces it kind of goes a little bit euro but it's still really muted it's not over the top and for that reason we put that into classic and this last slide here I really wanted to show you this because it shows how unique something can be where you're so here's the before and here's the after and when you look at this all across the board here you'll see that this here is you know curved pretty dramatic you could say euro you could say because of the way it is i mean that's almost modern kind of a surprise use over here you've got a moderate slope with your this straight, 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 right in the middle, kind of screams traditional. The knee braces are softened and curved. You've got brick, which could be traditional, could be classic. Over here, you've got your pergola open. It's copper on the top of that. If you do do this, metal on the top of pergola is a great idea. And then you still have the curves. So you, you look at all this in, in, in its entirety, and you think, wow, that's a neat mixture came out cool, but if you try to classify that as a category, you're gonna have bits and pieces from everything. So it's a great example that don't be afraid to mix and match. Your style is gonna be unique. Okay, now speaking of your style, in this book right here, I'm gonna give you an attitude questionnaire for Craftsman and Classic. It's on page 140 if you get the book. And we've got two attitude statements. So classic personified as well as classic. Classic as well as craftsman. Okay, so example A. Nothing makes me happier than seeing a well thought out plan competently executed. If something is not needed, get rid of it. I love balanced functional multi-tasking design. That's example A. Example B, I have a well-rounded perspective on life. Oversimplification of complex issues puts my teeth on edge. So oversimplification of complex issues versus careful detail planning. What resonates with you? So here you have it. Classic is the well-rounded perspective. You don't want to be bold and over the top. And they would say or somebody who's a classic type of person would say they're tawdry as a description for someone that gets real flashy. Um, but thoughtful, insightful, 
you know, careful old money, you might say, community focused. Well, the craftsman that that's the arts and crafts thing, and it's all about form following function and really solid planning. So there's two things you can choose, you know, how much of you you feel like is in the classic camp versus the craftsman. Kind of take pieces away from that as you see fit. So one question that I really like to hear your answer in working with you, and that is rustic factor. So if we take what you're going to do in your mind's eye for the information you have right now, and you say, okay, from A to Z, what is the look and feel that I'm looking for? Okay, so that's furniture, colors, lights. Timbers are going to have a big impact. You might have stone, cabinets. From A to Z, there's a lot of decisions you're going to make. What is the rustic factor? You've got rustic on one side, and you've got Spartan clean on the other. So the log cabin, lots of wood, that'd be a 10. And like a modern hospital, sleek surfaces, that'd be a one. Now where do you fall? Pay attention to that number if you're a eight, write that down. If you're a six, if you're a three, you know, whatever that is, write that down because it can help you in making decisions for all the, all the above colors, that sort of thing. And really on my end of it, I can, it gives me just kind of an intuitive way to interpret pictures and other information you give me, uh, which will help with timber sizing locations of timbers, geometric shapes, detailing, all the things that we've kind of been covering. Just a real easy gut check, another angle to drill this in, dial it in, and get you happiness that resonates for a long, long time. Okay, so we're winding down here. So why timbers? Coming back to that piece on the forts and the playhouse, what the idea is to join those two to where you have the fun and intuition, just kind of the intuitive building something for yourself, something to pass on. In the previous webinar, we talked about getting something that resonates so you can share it with friends and family. You can enjoy it in small little ways, little perks of delight throughout your day, kind of in small ways throughout the week, throughout the days, months. That's really some big value. The other piece we talked about was how wood is renewable. It's been a building material for ages and how it sequesters carbon and helps with climate change. So a lot of good reasons for why timbers. The biggest one, of course, is making it personal. It's a great way to express who you are and have some fun bringing that fort building in a way that is used with kind of some guidance and some universal truths, design truths and principles to have something fun. Uh, just it'd be part of you, just expressive. So that is why Timbers, and it goes back to chapters one through five, understanding why you're doing it and what you want. All right. So we are here with the actual book, of course, available for pre-order. If you go to aerotimber.com, it's available for pre-order there, and we will, I will, write a little thank you and sign it so you get an autographed copy, and during the launch, and including the planning guide as well. So really wish you a fun time. I wish you clarity and all of this for as you move forward. That is why we've written the book, to really help clarity, traction, good investment, all of the above. So enjoy it. Hope to meet you sometime. And we're done unless you want to hang around for the Q&A. Okay, so we're on the Q&A again. And we just take them right down from the, right down from the top. So... What if my style is different from my spouse's? I see this a lot, and it never really becomes a good, big deal 
unless Mama Bear and Papa Bear are really not on the same page and not communicating. And it really indicates a, a deeper problem. Sometimes when this happens, I've seen it a couple of times firsthand where you know, the two pieces just have a ideological difference or maybe there's some deeper relationship issues. And usually if that's the case, a building project can bust the whole thing apart. So not, if, if we're getting red flags at this stage, you know, can't get, can't get together. You know, that that's something to really pay attention to. It might be time to pull the plug with the building and work on some foundational issues first. But when the foundational issues are there, we've seen the styles blend and really come up with something unique that delights both parties. We've also seen the use of like a man cave or a den or an office to scratch, say the, say the man has a, what's well, a more rustic or more robust feel. And so, th so there's a lot of different things that we've seen people do that can solve this with great results. So how do I know if we're speaking the same language? And this comes down to, I'm gonna answer these two questions at the same time here. We've got, you know, does my builder speak my language? And really, if you're talking with your builder, I can't give you any real perfect, like if this happens, run. If this happens, you're on target. Nothing like that. What I can say is just pay attention to whether or not your builder, architect, designer, service provider, that would include me. If like, say I'm really, if I get what you're doing and the ideas that I kind of come up with, you know, some of them miss, but they kind of generally keep nudging closer. That's a good indication that we're speaking the same language. And from my own perspective, my own philosophy, what I think of is that it's on me to understand, for example, what does heavy mean to you? And what does classic mean to you? What does craftsman mean to you? So as we're working through this, I try to modify my understanding and nuance of the words you use and the pictures you show to capture that. And so that's speaking the same language, if that makes sense. So style decisions with more confidence. I think we've got this, but because it's so important, we're going to just say, first thing, why? Next thing, what? So what are you about anyway? Why do you want to build this? What are you hoping to accomplish? These are questions you might write down. <coughs> big, big questions. Handle them. You'll be well on your way. Once that is there, you've synthesized what you're trying to accomplish. Then you can go to the, I'm saying no to this. No to that. You build your no list. What are you saying no to? with what you're trying to achieve here. And so, you, so you're saying, what are you saying no to? And you build this list out. And you look each one in the eye, the fear of loss. You're gonna be golden. You're gonna have a great time. No worries for you. If your style's all over the map, you know, a, a variation of this question that we've heard is, I don't know if timbers even fit my style, especially with a re remodel. And one particular instance, I kind of wondered about it myself. The home style was built oh, maybe early 90s, was a complete hip roof. There was one gable end. And looking at the whole thing, it's just like, Will timbers even work? And I, so I went into the job kind of wondering, sharing the same concern the owner did. And 
at the end, following the process, it just works. Creativity and ideas are just floating in the air all around us. It's just a matter of some focus and you pick ideas out and they start to build and pretty soon you have something beautiful. In this case, the owner expressed it as, hmm, not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> that was his expression of good or looks really awesome. So don't be concerned about it. It's going to come together. Follow the process. Are there other popular timber frame styles? Yes, seven all told. We're covering two here. In the book, we have seven laid out for you. And there's a summary on the back. Just getting, not that you have to understand terms exactly, but just, again, building that intuition is really cool. It's really going to help you in expressing what you want, even helping you clarify what you want in your head. Uh, so, yeah, and, and I wouldn't worry about popular either. I'd pay attention to your own likes and dislikes, like we talked at the beginning of this, listening for that what you like and dislike. And that goes, that like and dislike goes right back to this, which style is best for you. So this next question here, the last one we're going to deal with, is how do you get an answer without covering five questions? So what I'm, we hear people complain about is that, wow, I mean, I wanted to be building right now. I mean, I started three months ago and I'm still scratching paper. I mean, how long is this going to take? And then we've got to get permits. And, oh, now it feels like we're starting over. And so these kind of complaints and frustrations are real, and, and, and I understand them. I think that the best thing to do is to understand this principle that before a tree gets a lot of vertical growth, there is roots being built. <laughs> Big root system, and then finally it shoots up. And scratching paper, getting a design, moving along, oh, having to roll all the way back, maybe even have to get a different piece of property, so it's a complete redesign. Only it's not a complete redesign. You've done a lot of work in this end to understand your wants and dislikes and all this. So it moves forward, but it's it's not a linear process. It's, it's got its ups and downs. And even the building process itself, uh, one little thing that you might want to write down with this too is there's kind of a, when the planning and stuff starts, it starts off pretty high, it might suffer a little bit, and then the plans come together. And then during the build, there's kind of this dip, and then it comes back up. And then here's where you live happily ever after. But there's, there's frustrations and communication problems within that as well, within the building process, as well as right here with the planning process, understanding huh, still more. And then, oh, man, I'm so tired of making decisions. You know, you just like to farm that out almost. And that's where interior designers really help out a lot. They help you cut through the clutter a little bit. But, again, nobody can help you unless you – do the work right here. You can have us and other professionals help you do this. In fact, a lot of times we'll do a quick version for people that don't have it together. We'll kind of synthesize what they're trying to achieve and say it back. And if it really lights up eyes, okay, we know that that's what we're going to keep going back to when we're making our design decisions to figure out what is going to work for them. There you have it. So, Glad you're with me. Thank you. Lucas?